everybody, and welcome to my lecture about advanced process technologies. I'm Professor Adam Tiemann of the Enix Labs at Bar Ilan University. Have you ever wondered how a FinFET device is made? Well, today that's what we're going to discuss. And before starting, I'd really like to give special credit to Alvin Loke, who has some great tutorials on this whole on this whole field and design. You can find many of them on YouTube, and I took a lot of my material that I learned from him and from Ornachum, one of my students in one of my former courses who worked at Intel and provided me with a lot of the data and a lot of the, the knowledge that I needed to know. So let's get started. We have five parts to our lecture, starting with moving to the third dimension, going through fabrication of FinFETs, layout of FinFETs, um, layout dependent effects and parasitics, and finally some current trends. So starting with um, a chapter called moving to the third dimension. I want to start my lecture discussing the breakdown of Denard's Law. So in some of my previous courses, you may have heard me talk about Robert Denard. Robert Denard was one of the um, great engineers at IBM. He actually invented the DRAM as we know it today. Um, he, in 1974, wrote a, a, a paper where he observed that continuous scaling is enabled by a couple of things. First of all, if we scale the transistor dimensions by 30% and scale the supply voltage by 30%, we can get some cool effects. We can get 2x area reduction. So if we take our transistor dimensions and reduce them by 30%, that means 0.7 in the length and 0.7 in the width, that equals 0.49. That's kind of half, right? So we re reduced our area by 2x. We also get a 30 to 40% increase in frequency. So we're getting higher frequency, better performance, that sells more chips, and it also does a lot more calculations. And we, the one of the most important aspects of this, which I'm not sure how important it was at the time, but it turned into the most important probably um, observation of Denard, is that the power density stayed constant. However, um, you know, we were greedy, so we didn't scale the voltage according to the model. It actually wasn't only because we were greedy. Um, it was also because of all kinds of uh, different types of interfaces that needed, you know, standard voltages and so forth. So we kept voltages at 5 volts for a long time, went down to 3.3 volts, 2.5 volts, 1.8 volts. But it didn't scale at the same rate as uh, we scaled our, our, our length, our critical dimension of our transistor. Um, frequency was raised faster than the model. This is where we were really greedy. We wanted to have better performance. We wanted to sell faster chips. And so we raised frequency and, and keeping the voltage high was what enabled us to do that. Another thing that was kind of um, overlooked was that leakage w uh, was going to take over and become a really important factor. And when we wanted to keep, you know, uh, keep getting better frequency and we wanted to scale the voltage, we have to scale VT. And as we scale VT, we hit a point where subthreshold leakage really becomes dominant. And um, if, uh, a bunch of guys at Intel, if it was uh, Shekhar Borkar or the current CEO of Intel, Pat Gelsinger, they stood on all kinds of uh, uh, stages around the year um, 2000 or so, 2001, and showed a plot similar to this. And it's a really famous plot that shows the power density of Intel chips over the years. And when they showed this, I mean, uh, they were somewhere over, you know, around this area. And they were looking at, um, you know, these uh, Pentiums, these late Pentiums, and, uh, and, and they saw that the power density was getting really high. It was already, you know, the, the heat of a hot plate, as you can see over here. But keeping on scaling for just a few more years, you get to the heat of the, the power density, the heat of a nuclear reactor. And we're talking about, you know, 2005 or so, something like that. Keep on going, and by 2010, we're at the heat of a rocket nozzle. And there are actually versions of this graph where it goes up and you get a nice little sun over here. So you get really a, a crazy power density. And this, this power density crisis really shocked the world. Why does this happen? Well, it's a problem with voltage scaling, right? To keep the, uh, the constant power density, according to Denard's model, um, the supply voltage needs to be scaled along with the other critical dimensions. So if the power density it can be uh, modeled as, you know, the frequency times the capacitance times the, the, the voltage squared, and we divide that by the transistor area, you know, which is the length times the width, then um, if we scale by S, that's S, and that's 1 over S, and that's um, S squared, and it divided by S squared. And that really, um, those cancel out, you know, and we, we get this uh, constant voltage, uh, constant um, uh, uh, power density scaling. So this and this cross out, and this and this cross out, and power density, you know, stays constant. 
However, um, it also requires the scaling of the threshold voltage. So when we, we scale, you know, the uh, VDD over there, we, um, we have to keep scaling the VT. Otherwise, our, our uh, voltage, you know, our, our current um, goes down. So when we keep on scaling VT, what happens is that the, the um, off current of a transistor, it really starts uh, going up. So the off current of a transistor, as you can see here, is exponentially dependent on on VT. And if we uh, scale VT, what happens is that we're going to get this um, exponential rise in the off current of a transistor, and we're not going to have our switch be have it, which requires a high on ion to eye off ratio. Or um, we're also just, if we keep on scaling VT, we're just going to have um, a lot of leakage, which is going to dominate our, um, our power. So there are two big factors over here that limit this. Uh, first is the subthreshold swing of the transistor. And usually when we talk about um, you, you know, leakage and how well the transistor works as a switch, we, we look at this subthreshold swing. And we do that by taking this, um, this VGS to, to ID type of a plot and put ID on a logarithmic scale. So what you see over here is the regular area where we're uh, above VT, but under VT we have this uh, exponential dependence on, uh, you know, exponential dependence, which is linear in this logarithmic graph. Okay, and the uh, basically the uh, um, the the, the, the uh, slope over here, this graph is the subthreshold swing, and we actually are asking how many millivolts we have to go in the x-axis in order to get a decade less um, uh, uh, leakage or less current in the y-axis, and we want that to be as sharp as possible, which means the subthreshold slope has to be as, as, as the subthreshold swing has to be as low as possible, the fewest amount of millivolts to get you know a, a big decade drop over here. Um, and this is limited, okay? Uh, and it's been getting worse and worse in, uh, in planar technologies as we've um, scaled down. And the reason is mainly because we have these parasitic capacitances, um, which you could look at them as like the diffusion capacitance and the body capacitance, which are pulling against the gate capacitance. They're, they're not allowing all the control to come over from the gate. So what we want is to have only this capacitor over here, this C-Ox. But we have these other capacitors that are pulling against it and not letting us have a perfect transfer function from the gate over to the channel. Um, the other thing is that we have Dibble, so when we, we uh, put some voltage on VDS over here, we're actually increasing the depletion region, um, and we're, we're, make, we're, again, taking control off of the gate. So Dibble makes the, this graph rise up higher, and it gives us even more leakage. So those two things are really limiters um, when, we, when we scale the voltage and, uh, and VT and so forth. So that brought uh, the whole world basically to the multi-gate solution, which is uh, an idea that came up already in the late 90s or, or maybe even uh, before that, how to solve this type of stuff. So if this is our planar transistor, there were thoughts of, okay, maybe um, we can just add another gate that's buried underneath the transistor. And, and uh, you know, SOI type of technology kind of in a way does this with the back gate. And that kind of gives us another uh, uh, more control over the channel or maybe um, reduces at least the, the, con the uh, control that the body, uh, the body capacitor is bothering us and getting on the channel. Um, that turned into the tri-gate or the FinFET device, um, which uh, is what we've been using for the last uh, number of years, since 2011 when Intel showed it for the first time in a product. And uh, you see this has three sides um, uh, that's controlling the channel. And we're only like kind of bothered with, uh, you know, a little bit on the sides and the bottom. Um, the next step, of course, is the gate all around type. And a horizontal gate all around is like this, where we have the gate that's all around the channel over here. And we get really four sides of controlling the channel and very little parasitic capacitance that's fighting against us. So that's really what ha has helped us, and it gives us a much better subthreshold slope, as you can see here, the tri-gate subthreshold slope versus the planar subthreshold slope. And um, it also allows us to use lower VTs and uh, and get uh, faster gates and so forth. So so FinFETs or uh, multi-gate solutions are really the way that um, the world has gone. So what is the FinFET? Looking at a planar transistor again, what we have here, um, you know, is the source and the drain over here and the gate over it. The channel's here in the middle, okay? And so what we have here are all these uh, carriers that are running from the source to the drain under this big channel over here. When we go over to the FinFET, on the other hand, we have this raised fin. The source and the drain are raised above 
the uh, above the substrate over here, as you can see. And we have the gate that's all around it. And the channel is this yellow part that's in the middle here. And we have the transistors running from the source to the drain just within this confined area versus running in, uh, inside this whole um, area over here, which you can see in this area. So um, it's this blue area over here where we have the um, electrons running through. So this is a 3D structure, right? We, uh, well, I guess you could call it two and a half dimensional, but it's some sort of other dimension. We actually build on top of the planar level of the substrate, which was how our planar devices were built before, and we're going in kind of an extra level, okay? It gives us uh, more um, on current and in GM and gain per area. So um, since we go up to this th third dimension, the height of the fin actually provides us more um, carriers that can go, more current that can go past here. So versus the, uh, the, the planar structure, which only had the short channel, the, the, the very uh, shallow channel that had uh, carriers, now we can have the third dimension. And it, ultimately, you could go as high as you want and provide more current for that type of an area. Um, it is a fully depleted channel. Well, what that means is that beforehand we had these um, the, this charge that we would put inside the channel that would help us set VT and so forth, and now we use a fully depleted structure where we don't have any charge. We use an intrinsic type of a, of, a, of silicon um, or, or channel material instead of a, uh, a, a um, something that has charge in it, and that gives us a lot of good stuff. Um, RDF random doping fluctuation, which was a real big problem with variation in uh, in in nanoscale planar devices because we had very few dopants in the channel. I mean, it was down to less than 100. And when it's a statistical process that actually gets those dopants stuck inside the channel, it's really easy to have uh, variation for a few here and a few there, which caused huge variation on VT. So now that we have this, um, this fully depleted device, RDF has become almost a, a, a non-factor. Um, it also provides us with uh, less dibble and body effect is, is almost negligible in this type of a device. Okay, one of the features of it, um, I'm not saying this is an advantage at all, is that we have a quantized channel width. So again, this is our structure. That's what it is. The width is always just one uh, width versus uh, a planar device where we could make it as wide as we wanted um, per se. Okay, so that means if we want a wider transistor, we have to take several of these fins and put them next to each other. So we get this quantized channel width. And one of the very big disadvantages of this type of device is it has really problematic parasitics, as we'll see later. So the, the source and drain resistance is very high, the source and drain coupling to the gate is very high, and these kind of things really bother us in, in the design. But if we look at a, a kind of dashboard of the advantages of this type of a FinFET device, we can see that, first of all, we get lower power. Look, with a FinFET, we can have a much lower uh, VDD, and lower VDD means VDD square is lower, that means we have lower power. We have much lower leakage. So as you can see here, the FinFET has a lower eye off. And we can also reduce the VT and still have, you know, a lower eye off. So we can reduce VT, reduce VDD, you know, and, and we win-win in all those uh, cases. We have higher intrinsic gain. So both the GM is, uh, is higher and the R out is higher of this type of device, which is really good for analog design. Okay, it's a better switch. So the R on is lower. Okay, the VT can be lower because it's a better switch because we have the better ion to I off ratio. And we have much lower mismatch because uh, we don't suffer from random doping fluctuations anymore. In fact, most of our mismatch is now things like line edge roughness and so forth. Okay. It also, of course, has a smaller area. So in summary, the FinFET really provides us with an improved PPA, power performance and area. So that was just a, uh, an introduction, why we're moving to the, the third dimension, motivation for it, and we'll continue uh, into fabricating, fabricating a FinFET.